when I tell people about uh, your first book, Never Split the Difference, I, I explain it and say, look, the author was an FBI negotiator and he was doing hostage negotiations and you could never say, hey, I'll take half the hostage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? You right. could never, it, you know, and it's part of your book. And it, and it really summarized it in like a nutshell of the author. Like, no, Never Split the Difference is being able to like win every negotiation because you can't get half the hostage. You need the whole hostage back. When Chris was going into negotiations, he had one goal and there wasn't really a meet in the middle scenario. How would you describe it better than that? Or what would you, what would you change or add on to that quick? No, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, meeting in the middle is, you know, it's a, it's a recipe for both sides losing something. Mm-hmm. And the real problem is that no, you don't lose even. Like uh, a Nobel Prize winning behavioral economics theory from 2002 from Daniel Kahneman, prospect theory, effectively says lost things twice as much as an equivalent gain. Now, this is for humans. This isn't for Americans or Caucasians or English speakers. This is for human beings. So how does that play out in this whole compromise idea or meeting in the middle? You're never going to feel like it was an even trade because if lost things twice as much as an equivalent gain, let's say you give in a dollar, it feels like two dollars. Mm-hmm. And so to get even with the other side, you got to take two dollars out of their hide. And now they've lost two dollars. Now for them to feel even, they got to get you for four. And this is a recipe for a downward spiral. So it's, it's human, human nature just compromise makes us angry makes us feel cheated, makes us feel like, you know, the, the F-bomb in negotiation. They, we feel it wasn't fair. Yeah. And just understanding the emotional dynamics that drive how we evaluate, then as soon as we start applying in real life, then we're out of this whole compromised mindset and people are making deals they never thought would be possible. Yeah. So the... But some people would say, like, if you're going to um, if you're going to win every argument, right, if you're going to come out getting exactly if you're going to go into this negotiation, like this is what I need and I need it 100 percent. Right. And if you always get that, isn't that going to ruin? like how does that not ruin the long term relationship? Right. He said, no, if we meet in the middle, it's going to ruin our chances of doing business in the long term. But if you get everything you wanted. So so help help people understand that. Remember, you don't get in life what's fair, you get what you negotiate. If you want to become a better negotiator, click the link in the description below. The first thing that we do in order to reframe people's thinking, you know, give you a different mindset, give you a different religion, yeah. if you will. Um, you know, we take the word argument out entirely. Like if it's about an argument, then you're already in a recipe for a disaster, a zero-sum game, both sides lose. Now we got one of our, one of our clients that we put through a special, you know, we don't call it a mastermind, but we put our, our top performing big time entrepreneurial CEOs in a special group. So they were with their peers. And I interviewed one of them after it was over and he said, I made so much more money being collaborative than I ever made being cutthroat. Now he taught his people how to do this and he taught his people to get on the phone. And stop talking about price and start talking about delivery and terms and give the other side the opportunity to throw a change in terms of you that's actually more profitable for you. Now, they suggested it so it works for them. And this is when you start to get into areas where both of you can make more money if you just collaborate. Now, that's kind of the Harvard definition of better negotiation. But they, you know, they want to approach it in an an academic way and they didn't have the emotional tools, emotional intelligence tools that hostage negotiators had to navigate emotions. So what we do is we get people out of the cultural competitive mindset into collaboration if and only if that makes more money for you. Like ideally, you love being collaborative because you have long term relationships and you sleep better at night and people like you more. But that needs to be the secondary benefit. The primary benefit, your responsibility is to make more money for yourself and your company, to give your kids a better future, to put your kids in a better, in a bigger house, to provide more for your family. 
And so making that transition to collaboration, unless you, unless you find a way to understand it's actually more profitable, is a very tough transition. Yeah. Yeah. In real estate, we have, it's like, you know, there's like contractors. You know, what most agents also deal with is, is remodeling contractors and, you know, construction and things like that. And I could see collaboration probably working. It's, it's very common to say, how much is this going to cost? Right. And then say, can you do it for less? Is if it's like it's it's always like you ask the contractor how much is this remodel going to cost and then you go can you do it okay well can you do it for less right right and then you and then you go well okay if you can I'm going to call somebody else so you call like eight people and you try to figure out who can do it for less and the and that is um, some people would say good business some people would say cutthroat the but it's not collaboration and so could you think of how the how that those conversations could be collaborative. You know, when somebody's reaching out and going, Hey, I need to figure out how to hire a contractor. When you're, when you're saying like, let's make it their idea. What's a way that someone could practice that? Well, contractors, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And contractors are tough business, which mm-hmm. has to do a lot more with price. It has a lot to, more to do. What's their back office look like? Like I kind of deal with a contractor once where they wanted a certain amount down to buy materials. Mm-hmm. And I said, look, uh, give me a list of the materials. I'll go buy them. Let me take this off of your back office's task list because your back, every contractor's back office is support staff. I mean, these people are scrambling. They're having trouble getting stuff done. I mean, that's a cost for the contractor, the cost of implementation. What are the costs of implementation that we can change that actually cost you less, but that I may be able to shoulder? And I went out, I got a list of the materials. We went out, we bought all the materials. We got them on site. Contractor got out there, did the job immediately, and we paid him the profit. And it, would, it was one of the quickest and smoothest jobs a contractor ever did. And it helped him balance out, you know, he's got cash flow issues. How do I get the cash into your hands? How do we make it easy for you to implement? I mean, there's all sorts of things that are involved in implementation other than price. Yeah, And you get into a conversation where how can we tailor the terms to make this more profitable for you? Well, then I got a better set of terms and you made more money. Now, you have to be able to get in there and explore the issue with the other side. And, you know, we can tell you it's more profitable. But then also what happens then once you get started in that, your deal velocity with people gets gets much quicker. Like I did an interview with Mark Cuban probably about a year and a half ago. And he spends a lot of time ironing things out and methods of doing business. A lot of time on the first deal. Mm -hmm. So once they know what works best for the other side, then everything after that accelerates. Oh, you, you actually show up on time? Well, I need to get my act together on time so I can match what you're going to do. There's so much that affects profitability. Price is only one aspect. And in many cases, you can increase the other side's profitability and make it a better deal for you simultaneously. It sounds like, too, if I'm if I'm calling a contractor and the and they're and if they say, hey, I want you to put 50 percent down right away, that it's that probably a great way to go with that conversation is just start to ask them why. Right. Like. So why do you need that 50% down? Cause I'm not okay with that 50% down. So why do you like, why do you need that? Because maybe there's something, maybe there's a, something in there that I could fix a different way that I'm comfortable with. Like your seer. Is that, does that make sense? Is that a good idea? Is, or would you do that a different way? Well, uh, so the, what you're trying to do is exactly what you need to be doing. Now, unfortunately, what you're trying to do is often, uh, you create friction and problems by how you do it. Now, what the heck am I talking about? Yeah. The word why, like there is so much bad advice out there. It says, find out their why. Okay, let me ask why. The problem is, and I learned this as a hostage negotiator, why universally makes people feel defensive. Like if I were to say to you right now, why did you wear that shirt? You got an instantaneous defensive reaction. Well, what's wrong with this shirt? Like, I like this shirt. Why don't you like my shirt? Because every human being globally has been conditioned when you were two years old and you broke something, the nearest giant next to you, which is an adult, pointed their finger at you and said, why did you do that? 
in every culture on earth. So uh, we found out one of the things I learned in hostage negotiation, like why always makes people feel accused, which it possibly leads to anger and being upset. And it's friction. Now, how do you do it better? If I just say to you, son, instead of why did you wear that shirt? I said, what made you wear that shirt? You felt that land differently. Yeah. It felt less accusatory. That's one of our skills. We refer to that as a calibrated question. Calibrated questions need to start with very specific words because the way it lands emotionally. And generally speaking, what lands well, because people love to be told to tell other people what to do. So what, yeah. what tends to land deferentially? Now I could pick a third way, depending upon my read of you in a moment, and I'd say, seems like you got a good reason for wearing that shirt. Now you're laying that out immediately. With the contractor, not why do you need 50% down? The Black Swan method way in that instance would be like, seems like you got a good reason for needing 50% down. That yeah. contractor is going to lay out their good reasons for part of that money. And the crazy thing is, for what they, what they don't have good reasons for, seems like, which is what we refer to as a label. Again, it's this stealth emotional intelligence weapon. It hits your brain in a very different way. When you have a good reason for it, you can't wait to tell me. And the crazy thing is, if you don't have a good reason for it, you'll say like, well, actually, and you'll be very honest with me and you'll lay it out. I had one in D.C., one of our students at Georgetown, MBA part-time student. He worked for a contractor during the day. They had a subcontractor that was not performing and it was screwing a whole project up. So he sits down with the subcontractor and says, seems like you got a good reason for not doing the work on time. And the subcontractor right. looked down and said, nah, we don't. Now, I don't know why. Seems like you got a good reason for that. He just bring differently and pulled the honesty out of him. I don't got to know why. I'm a layman. I know what works. And we've seen stuff like that work time and time again. And when the subcontractor who wasn't performing said, nah, we really don't. He didn't feel accused, backed into a corner, called out. It put him in a collaborative mode and they worked it out and they fixed the problem. It is such, it's such fascinating stuff, really. Like, cause that conversation is like, so why can't you get this done on time is a very defensive. What's making you get this done on time, like a little bit better or there's yeah. a way yep. but then seems like you've got a great reason. It gives them every ability that if they do have a great reason, like they're in the power position. And so they're getting to feel heard. But then when they don't, I could see them actually, I could actually see that going. Seems like you got a good reason for that 50% deposit. And they might even just reply back of like, well, we could do 20% instead. Like I could see them start negotiating against themselves just from that question that wasn't even adversarial. Yeah, exactly. As soon as you remove yourself as a threat, as soon as you stop being the adversary, and that's one of the great things about labels, then it changes the conversation. And they feel, you know, human beings are actually hardwired to collaborate. How, how, what makes me say that? Tal Raz, a co-author of Never Spit the Difference, the writer, said, you know what? What, what, what of our ancestors, our prehistoric ancestors, the only ones that survived were the ones that collaborated. The ones that didn't collaborate died alone in the dark in a cave with nobody around them. And they don't have any descendants. The collaborative humans survived. And so we have a hard wire into us to collaborate. We just need to know that the person we're talking to wants to collaborate with us. 